At the end of every series uh, at 1830, we want to do something called Q&A, which stands for Question the Answers, in which we start to deconstruct some of the things that we've been exploring over the last few weeks. And I thought, what better way to do that as a community uh, than to actually engage with a few different kinds of people who represent radically different backgrounds. Our first panelist tonight is uh, Dr. Joel Thiessen. Thank you for joining us, Joel. Joel is uh, the professor of sociology at Ambrose University. He also is the chair of the Flourishing Congregations Institute, which is one of the leading uh, research bodies bodies in Canada about emerging religious trends across our nation. And so Joel, we're really excited for you to join us tonight. And Joel's going to speak a little bit into some of the work that he's been doing. Then we're joined by David Harvey, uh, who is our teaching pastor here at Westside, if you're joining us for the first time. David uh, has a PhD in New Testament studies, um, and so we might be here all night Um, because there's plenty to say around that. But let's see what happens. Uh, So David, we're really excited for you to join us as well and and bring a little bit of conversation around how we learn to talk to one another uh, really based around biblical principles. What do we learn from the Gospels that helps us to engage across faith and culture? And then finally, Rabbi Shaul Osarche is joining us from Beth Sedek Synagogue. Uh, Rabbi Shaul is one of the leading uh, rabbis in the Jewish community in Calgary. He also chairs a number of different interfaith initiatives, the Interfaith Build Project at Habitat for Humanity, which Westside is also a huge sponsor and partner of. Uh, Rabbi Shaul also leads the uh, Interfaith Council as well as the Jewish and Muslim Council. So he has incredible experience experience and an incredible passion for bringing different kinds of faith communities together and seeing how we can engage and talk. So we're excited uh, to jump in tonight. Let me give you, just before we get started, a little bit of a plan for the evening. Each of our panelists is going to present for about seven minutes on on some differing pieces, and then we're going to jump in to our Q&A. Joel's going to talk about the growing divide between faith and culture. And then David's going to follow up with talking a little bit about a theological approach to how we engage across culture and across different lines. And then Rabbi Osage is going to talk about interfaith dialogue. And maybe this way of talking across faith communities actually can teach the world a better way to to engage, to find commonality, to listen, and to talk without throwing rocks at each other. So we're excited to jump in. After that, we're going to go into our Q&A. Now, on the screen throughout the night, you'll see a number. You can text your questions into that number, and then we're going to engage in them together. Okay, we might send the mic around as well, but I encourage you to really digest what you're hearing, think about it, and then think about what kind of questions you want to ask. Uh, We want to have a, a, a really significant conversation that allows each of us to speak uh, from our own unique perspectives. Uh, And so as we jump in tonight, uh, what we're really seeking to do is create a platform for engagement. The vision of what we do at 1830 is a way of learning to grow uh, together in dialogue, to actually say that maybe this journey and this spiritual life isn't about information. Actually, if it's about transformation and growth, that is always a relational concept. And that's something that we always have to do in community with one another. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, jump in. And Joel, you're going to get us started. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. So I teach sociology. I think about culture. I study religion in Canada, and I think about the intersection between religion and culture. I want to begin by making two uh, starting statements or ideas, and then draw some parallels to uh, the conversation at hand. Here's idea number one. Uh, It's something that sociologists talk about as the homogeneous unit principle. Basically, this means that study after study across the social sciences reveal... um, that human beings tend to gather with others who are like themselves. When you look at marriages and family, for example, we tend to marry others who are of the same social class, same race or ethnicity, same religion, same perspective on the world, and so forth. When you look at neighborhoods around cities, we tend to move to neighborhoods, and you look at neighborhoods that they tend to be fairly homogeneous, same social class, same racial or ethnic groups that gather together, and so forth. When you look at congregations, we know that Sunday mornings are the most racially segregated hour of the social week. Most congregations worship with others of the same ethnic groups, of the same social class groups, uh, the same orientations toward the world, and so forth. And so in all of these settings, human beings tend to gather with others who are like ourselves, We tend to amplify a particular perspective and narrative on the world over and against others who might think or behave differently than ourselves. This is the first idea. Homogeneous unit principle, we tend to gather with others who are like ourselves. Second idea. 
We make all kinds of assumptions about other groups and stereotypes about other groups of people who we generally do not interact uh, with and uh, groups that we more often than not have assumptions that are just plain wrong. We tend to make assumptions about other groups, uh, about people who are of lower social class, who are of upper social class, certain ethnic groups, certain religious groups. We make all kinds of inferences about other groups and more often than not, we don't actually know anyone who are part of those groups and we don't interact with those groups. So you can imagine then, when we are dealing with increasing of inability and culture for constructive disagreement, of the widened gap between those of differing views, how and why these sociological facts come to the fore. I would say sociologically that part of the reason that we are unable to constructively debate, dialogue, and even disagree is because we tend to only or primarily associate with those who look like us, who think like us, and so forth. And then we infer all kinds of things about those who are not part of our group. I want to give you a concrete example out of my own research on, on religion. Uh, in one of my books, uh, The Meaning of Sunday, I talk about uh, the fastest growing group in Canada, those who say they have no religion, represents 24% of Canadian adults, 32% of Canadian teenagers. In studying this group, lots of fascinating things, but a recent study came out, uh, an Angus Reid study, that asked Canadians to share their feelings of how positive, neutral, or negative they felt towards other religious groups. And when evangelicals in Canada answered this question, as you might expect, evangelicals had fairly positive views toward their own, right? Towards Catholics, mainline Protestants, evangelicals, and even Jews, they have positive responses. But towards every single other group, evangelicals have negative views. And they have the strongest negative views towards those who say they are atheists. Okay, keep in mind what I just said. One of the fastest growing groups are those who say they have no religion, of which atheists are a subcomponent of that group. And evangelicals have the strongest negative perceptions and views towards those who identify as atheists. Conversely, when you ask those in Canada who have no religious identification, their perceptions towards all these other groups, their strongest disdain towards any group is toward evangelicals. So what does this mean in light of some of the things? Homogeneous unit principle, we gather with those who are primarily like ourselves. And second, we make all kinds of inferences about other groups that we generally don't know members of those groups and we don't interface with those groups. What I'm suggesting here is that evangelicals and those who do not have any religion have the strongest disdain toward one another in part because these groups have very little interaction with one another. And so what is a possible way forward? A few things uh, to conclude my time. If we want to pursue constructive debate, dialogue, and disagreement, it necessitates that we regularly and consistently rub shoulders with those who are different than ourselves. And you could insert all kinds of categories of people who are different than ourselves. What might this look like in your own personal life? If you identify as an evangelical, for example, even if you don't, but you're part of an evangelical group, are you close friends with those who don't identify as evangelical? with those who don't identify with any kind of religious faith at all. In your church setting, do you interact with different members of different groups, different age groups, different ethnic groups, and so forth? What are you reading these days that might broaden your perspective on the world? Are you reading things and authors that might fundamentally go against things that you might naturally be inclined to read and to agree with? I think if faith communities wish to curb the trend and show a better kind of engagement within today's society, then faith communities need to model these things internally first. And then they and their members need to move beyond themselves and engage with others in open and constructive listening and dialogue. So hopefully these are some things that at least get the ball rolling and thinking in that, that direction. So I'll pass it on. And now I'm confused. <laughs> there we go. Is that working? Fantastic. Um, thank you, Joel. And uh, strikes me in terms of how I was thinking of, uh, of of talking this evening. There's a kind of natural connection, actually, in, in all of this piece. When the, the phrase that you talked about, uh, these uh, homogenous unit principle, um, where humans gather in groups like themselves, I 
I would often use an old term to describe what it is that governs our, our need to, to be like that as people. And uh, a term that gets used a lot in the ancient world, uh, a lot in uh, non-Western parts of the world, and the word would be honor, right? Uh, that we have this, this need, uh, well, put it simply this way, honor is the good opinion of the people who matter to us. Right. So we, we group ourselves into groups. Uh, this would be my reading of this, but I'm very aware of the fact from the presence of a sociologist when I say this. But, but my reading of it would be this, that we group ourselves into these groups, and, and I fundamentally agree with you, that are actually quite like ourselves. And therefore what happens is the opinion of the people within these groups that like us matters more to us than the opinion of people outside of those groups. So there can be a tendency uh, to hear that, you know, oh, you know, evangelicals have a negative view to use some of the data you threw. Evangelicals have a negative view towards atheists. And we go, okay, that's probably bad, right? But then we hear atheists have a negative view towards uh, evangelicals. And there's an easy ability to go, ah, oh, okay. You know, that it's quite easy to dismiss that, actually, as, as, as a person within a particular group. Because you're thinking, well, my personal standing, my own personal honor, isn't being shaped and governed by people that are not in the circles that I consider valuable. I'm, I'm kind of trying to do this in some sort of... Uh, caricature, I'm hopefully not expressing my exact personal opinion in this. Um, so, I, And I think that what happens then, that this is my take on these things, that, and I don't really know the language we use in contemporary culture to often talk about what the ancients would have called honor, but how we present ourselves in public becomes this sort of process of attempting not to lose face, to present ourselves in a good way so that the people that matter to us, that are in our circles of influence, what they think of us matters a lot. So uh, pushing this, uh, and this is where it's always dangerous to borrow somebody else's examples and work with them, but, but pushing this, if, if evangelicals and atheists are these divided groups, what you often find is that what's difficult for the individual evangelical to have a conversation with the individual atheist is, the evangelical has to contend with, what do, my other, what do the other people in my group think of me when I'm doing this? Right? And am I playing by the rules of the group whose influence matters to me, by the rules of the group who's, who are watching and observing my behavior? Um, Social theorists that I've engaged with anyway, we talk about this process, a language that's beginning to rise to talk about this is the language of face work. It's actually the language of, of how do you avoid losing face in public? How do you manage your public persona in such a way that the people that matter to you think the things you want them to think about you? And I think we all do this all the time. You only need to walk into a school, a university, a workplace, and you see people managing their perceptions of, of themselves and how people think of them. And what I've started to, to, to wonder about is how, is how when we're trying to do that, how difficult it is to have open and honest dialogue. Because the whole time that I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about what are the people that, that I am concerned about what they think about me thinking about this conversation that's going on. And it becomes very hard to be honest. And then if it feels like the conversation moves into difficult and awkward space, what then do I start to defend? Do I de start to defend the truth of our dialogue or do I de defend my perception in public? So the, the New Testament uh, scholar in me at this point kind of whacks on a right turn signal and pulls the park brake and we, we turn left into Galatians 2 where I think we see this exact sort of scenario happening where, where Paul and Peter are having this argument where you have two groups of Christians trying to figure out how they put together their, their shared faith. And they're all interpreting bits of text differently, coming to different conclusions. And there's this, this little moment in this sort of conversation where Paul sort of picks Peter up on how he is being inconsistent in his behavior. At one point, Peter was processing out his theological position in one way, and then because of a group of influencers that were quite significant to Peter, his own, uh, you know, homogenous unit, you might want to call it, Peter now starts to shift his view and Paul's problem is that Peter's shifting his view, not because of what he believes at core to be true, but because of what the group that influenced him, he thinks they want him to think, ultimately. And so, so the, the, the kind of the Bible student in me wants to sort of make this kind of statement, that I think sometimes why we struggle to discuss well theologically is oftentimes our theological positions are more shaped by our honor 
or our perception of what people think of our positions than they are by text and scripture, right? So we, we actually find ourselves picking up ideas. And, and I think you see this happen. We, we import societal ideas into our religion. And then we actually start to defend these societal ideas as religious, almost. We, we talk about things and we say, oh, well, it says it in the Bible or it says it in this particular text. And we're now using text to defend ideas that we've picked up through our society. And I think you see this. And now, I'm aware of the fact my accent gives away my foreignness at some level. But when you move countries, you see this really strongly happening. The blend between our group culture, our whatever, however big that, you know, because and again, <laughs> deferring to your sociological prowess, but, but a, a homogenous group can be, can be quite a big group of people and a small group of people. So where the divide between what's Canadian and what's Christian, for example, or what's Albertan and what's Christian can actually get quite blurry for us if we're not careful. And all of a sudden we're defending ideas which are perhaps actually just Canadian ideas. We're defending them as Christian ideas. So then when we deal with, uh, you, know, re you know, refugees or immigrants or, or, or any type of sort of personal and, and group that comes from something other than our normal unit, it's amazing for me how quickly Bible text starts to get rolled out in defense of a position that's probably more social than it is religious, if, if, that, if that follows. So for me, what's fascinating is in Galatians chapter 2, when Paul sees this sort of exact situation unfolding in this debate between these two groups of Christian that are actually being governed by social principles but trying to argue that they're theological, Paul does what I think all good Bible scholars should do, is he just rolls out a piece of Bible text and he refers to a text in Deuteronomy 10 and verse 17. And in Galatians 2, 6, he talks, it's often translated in the English translation, it says, God shows no partiality. And now, I'm fascinated because of my interest in social theory that actually literally in the Greek, Paul says, God does not take face. Uh, so it really fascinates me in this world where we're constantly trying to not lose face, where we're trying to constantly trying to present ourselves in a way that's acceptable to the groups that matter to us. Paul's take on that theologically is, I don't know why you're doing that because God's not actually that interested in that sort of thing. And I think that that starts to free us to dialogue better. If we can realize at some level theologically that your standing in your homogeneous unit is actually irrelevant to God, then actually what do you really think about something or what do you actually feel you should say about that? So Peter's fear is that one particular group are pressuring him to act and behave a particular way in Galatians 2. Paul's problem is not that, that Peter might disagree with him. Paul's problem is that Peter isn't actually saying what he really thinks because he's worried about what somebody else thinks of him. And so I find myself constantly convinced that a lot of the times our problem in dialogue, and this is just, uh, you know, I might be grandstanding one point that's not as big as, I, as, as it should be, but I find myself constantly wondering in a lot of dialogue what we're really talking about. And I find myself often wondering is if we're not more worried about what other people would think if we reached certain decisions than, if act than actually wondering about what the right thing to do is. How do we treat that particular group of people? How do we treat, you know, and, and the list is, is, is long that you could pick of example people's groups that you would meet in Alberta that choosing to side with one or show generosity towards one would cause you problems with another particular group. And I just find myself wondering how much our decisions as to how to dialogue or not dialogue are being governed by this age-old principle of face that, well, what will everyone think? And what would it look like if we governed our dialogue by, well, by a principle that is both found in, in sort of Hebrew scripture and also in, in Christian scripture that says God's actually not particularly interested in your social standing in your particular social group. And so, so the text for me that then I, I find myself wanting to wrestle with, um, and this language has been used in, in different sort of contexts, but, um, and, I, and I'm trying to, I want to use the term, but not use it with all of its baggage that sometimes get attached to. But I wonder about the language of hospitality. Um, and I realize there's all sorts of theories of hospitality ethic out there and, and so on and so forth, but quite literally, just in its sort of core meaning as this, this sort of uh, philosenia in Greek, the, the, the love of the stranger, you know. So in ancient culture, because so strong was the perception of 
What's my social standing doing? How's my honor standing in my local group? How am I being perceived by anyone? It was actually very hard to welcome a stranger into your house because you could get caught up in this sort of, this sort of battle to impress your society. But actually what you find them doing, and some of the, the Roman writers write a lot about this, that you actually have to put down your honor concern. You have to lay down your concern for faith to welcome someone into your house, assessing that they're from a different group, so their perception about what's honorable might be different from yours. But the right thing to do is to welcome the stranger in. Strikes me as fascinating that in our contemporary culture, we all know the word xenophobia, but very few of us know the word philoxenia. So we all know what it is to be afraid of the stranger, but, but the, the, its comparable Greek term to love the stranger is, is less apparent to us. And so it strikes me that if we really do wrestle with the idea of a God who isn't interested in faith, then there's huge space for us to wrestle as Christians with what it looks like to drop all of those barriers that stop us from moving out of our homogenous units at some level and to step into something that says, what does it look like? And I suppose this is the theorist in me. This is what does it look like? to actually step into honest, open dialogue uh, with someone, not worrying about what this does for my own social standing, but simply being driven by that Romans 12 principle that says, extend hospitality to the stranger. So, so that, would be, that would be my sort of kind of attempt at a theological throw-in on that. Do you need this one? Thank you. Good. It's great to be the third one. <laughs> so... As a rabbi, I'm going to offer you some rabbinic commentary on both of their comments here. Um, now, there's a principle in, uh, in the Talmud, which is one of the first compendium of Jewish law, that says, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. So in the Talmud, they preserve both majority and minority opinions. So with due respect to both of you. So the first thing that, as I was listening that struck me was um, the idea of we tend to gather with people who are like us. That sounds very simplistic on one level, which is how we look. If we're, we belong to this church, we associate with people in this church. But it's much more complicated. As an example, uh, I'm a foreigner as well, American. <laughs> so if you're a Democrat and you associate with other Democrats, you're going to be associating with people who are different racial groups, different uh, perhaps gender persuasions in you, and so forth. So even within your group, there's challenges of a lot of diversity. And that then takes you into other kinds of more complicated relationships. Um, I, I enjoyed your comments on the word honor. So in Hebrew, the word honor is kavod. Mm. It comes from the root kaved, which means heavy, because people who are concerned about their honor often become arrogant, and they become burdened, loaded, with the kinds of uh, preoccupations that drive them to actually do and pander to people so that they're, they curry favor. The, the rabbis, uh, and, uh, 1,500 years ago, or 1,800 years ago, actually, one rabbi, Ben Zoma, said, uh, Ezehu Kavod, who is honored? And the answer was Hakovesh et Yitzro, the one who conquers his passions, the one who uh, puts another person before themselves. Mm. So, in this sense, there's a selfless quality about interacting with other people. And why should we do that? Because to go back to the comment we tend to gather with people. So why do we tend to gather with people like ourselves? I think from ancient times we did so because we wanted to protect ourselves, we wanted to survive. So you survive with the people that you have the most in common with, you form a band of protection, a society, a collective, that will allow you to continue on uh, and will, will uh, offer the greatest protection against all sorts of external enemies. <clears throat> In doing so, we developed then, from very, very primitive times, a sense that anyone who's not part of that, who's other, is therefore a threat to us. And I think that's what we see pervasively in our society, as we tend to 
uh, gather and retreat back into um, our communities for what we think is safety, in reality, we're doing so, but we're also doing negative projections on other people because we're saying that they're, they're threats. A um, couple, couple um, uh, years ago, at this very time, uh, Hanukkah and Christmas, so we had a, a Hanukkah program at the synagogue in which we had several imams and other Muslim leaders come, and we celebrated Hanukkah together, which is a festival of religious freedom. And at the very end, they helped light the eight-branched candelabra. We all had one or two words on a sign, and we flipped it over, and it said, we refuse to be enemies. In other words, our commitment is to encounter and engage the other, to break down the stereotypes, to break down the misunderstandings and conceptions that tend to create conflict and tension. So from a, from a theological point of view, if I may just say, to do this kind of behavior, to see other people as the other and project stereotypes and so forth on people, is counter what, to what all of our fundamental religious principles are, which is from the very beginning in Genesis, it says we're created by Selim Elohim, in the image of God. So that means that we all possess an element of divinity within us. And, and what does that mean? It means the following story. So there's a, a rabbi a couple hundred years ago who would had a congregation he would preach to the congregation and as he preached he would look out among the congregation and he would see the face of god because every single face was a reflection of that divinity it turned out that times got difficult the congregation could no longer afford to employ him so he took a job in the marketplace and in the marketplace with all the hustle and bustle it was very difficult for him to focus on seeing the face of god so he decided he would hire someone to just be there so that he could focus on this person and see God's face. Interesting. What I always ask and wonder about is, what kind of a person would he select? Would it be somebody that was exceedingly beautiful? Would it be somebody perhaps on the opposite end that perhaps was not appealing to most people's uh, uh, sense of beauty? Or was it just an ordinary face? I think it was an ordinary face. In other words, we should be able to see when we encounter someone, the face of God. And that should regulate then how we treat them. That should kick in our sense of values and our ethics about how we deal with people. Um, so I, I've jotted down some ideas about the principles of, of dialogue. How do we engage people? I think the first thing is, based upon seeing the face of God in everyone, that we should assume goodness. That the pr presumption is, this person is not a threat, but they are a good, wholesome person with good intentions, who has the same interests in life and in serving God as we do. That's number one. Have mekabel at kol adam besever panim yafot. Receive every person with a cheerful countenance. Secondly, you have to relate to people with respect. And that, that is the sort of corollary to humility. You have to respect them because like you, they were created in God's image. The third one is when you engage someone, you speak for only from your tradition. You don't try to interpret their tradition, tell people what you think about their tradition, you talk about who you are, your values, your tradition, and let them speak for themselves. I think also we were talking about assumptions and stereotypes. You have to suspend those when you're engaged in, um, in conversation and dialogue with other people. So the things that you may be think about people, the stereotypes that you may hold, don't conform. I um, <clears throat> had the... Uh, pleasure of um, giving a talk to a group of junior high school kids in town here. And it was uh, UN um, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And so I was talking to them about the Holocaust. And I said, why do you think they picked the Jews? And nobody could say that. I said, well, so what are, your, what are the stereotypes about Jews? And of course, they were all intimidated to 
to uh, say, although they knew. And so finally I kept prodding them because, come on, if we want to be honest here, if you want to learn, tell me. And this one kid said, well, they all have big, big noses. So I almost fell over laughing because this kid was South Asian. He had a honker that would put any <laughs> Jewish nose to shame. I mean, he had the big, I wanted to say, oh, you're a fellow Jew then. Uh, so, I mean, it was, it was just it was patently absurd. So we have to suspend certain uh, stereotypes and, and assumptions. The next thing I would say is we focus on open-ended questions. When we talk to people, we, we're not leading them to something. We're actually trying to listen. The, the hardest thing to do, I tell my bar and bat mitzvah kids this, if you learn nothing else from me this year before your bar and bat mitzvah, when you become a Jewish adult, you should learn to listen. God gave us two ears so we could listen. God put two gates on our mouths, lips and teeth, to keep it closed because most of the sins that we commit come from the mouth. So we have to listen. Um, I think the other piece is be humble in, in knowing that every tradition has problematic text, it has a problematic history, and we have disreputable adherence to all of our religions. So before you start casting blame on others, do a little self-reflection. None of us have clean hands. Um, I would also say that one of the, I think one of the mistakes of the people making dialogue is that they think the point of dialogue is to find common ground. That's not the point. Our distinctiveness, our peculiarity, is as valuable and as important as what we share in common. What, do, what, what separates us can be actually a great strength and tool. One of the most powerful experiences recently in, in uh, this city has been this interfaith council where we get together. Last year we, um, uh, we were involved in the UN World Interfaith Harmony Week. We won first place for that. And three of us went to Jordan to accept the prize from the King of Jordan. That opening night, we began with a call to prayer. We had Sikhs, we had Baha'i, we had uh, Christians of different stripes, we had Muslims of different stripes, we had Jews of different stripes. We had every stripe you can imagine. It was incredible. It was as if that was God's choir singing. Beautiful. So what distinguishes one from the other is particularly important and we should value that. Um, lastly, dialogue is not an, inter an interaction with people uh, of different faiths or different traditions or different, uh, whatever the difference is. It's not a, it's, it's not a, um, uh, a time for proselytizing. It's not a time to proselytize. You're not making a case, you're not going out and trying to convert people. If you are, you're gonna be singularly unsuccessful in terms of um, making, making a, a good, healthy relationship. So um, those are some of the thoughts that I had in terms of uh, the conversation tonight. And uh, it's a pleasure to be among young people here. Gets my passions going again. Are you talking about the people in the room or these two guys? Because this is very confusing for me. I'll start with them. Okay. okay. I'll start with the three of you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, great. thank you so much. Why don't we thank our panelists together? So thank you guys so much. I think that was some profound and uh, very um, challenging thoughts. Uh, and I'm excited to jump into a little bit of dialogue. So let me encourage you guys again to continue to text your questions onto the screen. And they're going to come up as we go. I've been watching you. And this is the first time I haven't seen all my young adults on their phone. So it's either, I mean, it's really interesting. And that's great. But I actually gave you permission to be on your phone tonight. And you didn't take it. It's not going to come again. So I encourage you to uh, text your questions in. And you can either designate that for any of our panelists or we'll just open it out. Let me start, though, and, and Joel, I thought I'd ask you a, a question here. I found what you said about uh, homogeneous unit principle uh, very, very interesting. Now, the idea of uh, coming together and, and, and kind of dwelling as much as we can in echo chambers and surrounding ourselves with people who agree with us, uh, to what extent would you say that has actually been 
um, exacerbated with the birth of social media. You know, in your own sociological work, to what extent is there actually a, almost a different uh, kind of trend emerging? Throughout this series, as we've been talking about, we've sort of said maybe the fundamental diagnosis of so many of the um, divisive issues that define our time is actually not necessarily the issue itself as much as it is that we've lost the art of listening to one another in a constructive way. And that's really what you touched on. But now we live in the age of social media. And of course, we see real examples of this in terms of uh, this, this new uh, phraseology that's arrived with fake news or alternative facts. This is all so rooted in a social media world. To what extent are those things connected and, and how, does, you know, how do they mutually inform one another? Sure. Yeah, I think social media exacerbates this uh, because we tend to gravitate towards things that either will make our, ourselves feel great will reinforce a particular worldview. So if I think this politically on said topic, then I'm gonna to continue to read all these people. See, there you see, all these other great smart people continue to think like I do, therefore, and I'm gonna to try to cloud these kinds of things out. So we'll use the fake news example, right? Even if you're not uh, conservative politically, you don't watch Fox News, etc. I imagine that these kinds of things you're particularly going to shelter from your social media feed. Uh, oh, I'm not going to follow those kinds of people because they're on this kind of rant, etc. So I think that social media uh, is yet another avenue by which we reinforce these particular perspectives. I'm not arguing these are good things. I mean, a good sociologist will describe and explain reality, and I think this is what we do. We, we tend to find other groups in social media channels that continue to reinforce the things that we believe to be true. Yeah, it's interesting to see the, the more connected we are across the world, the less connected we are across the fence, you know, and, and our inability to talk to people who just arbitrarily end up in our lives might actually be a real key to moving forward and growing community. Yep. Now, do we have any questions ready to go up on the screen here? Let's see what we got. Okay, here's our first one. Is division in society a natural occurrence or something that is created intentionally? Um, David, why don't you field that a little bit for us? It seems like a, a, an easy question for a sociologist, so let's make it an uneasy <laughs> question for a theologian. Which I'm very happy you're taking the lead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I am less, less happy to answer this question. Um, so I won't. Uh, the, uh, it strikes... It strikes me. So I'm going to I'm going to stay on my on my uh, on my fence post uh, at the minute and sort of try and blend the two things together. I am struck by just your comments just there and your question. Uh, I can't help but just flag up that the first major social uh, sort of social media platform that hit us is called Facebook. Um, it strikes me as fascinating that this need to present a particular face to present here's me as I want you to know me, right? Not the real me, but the but the presence of a, of a particular me. Um, I am personally of the opinion, uh, in terms of my understanding of, and, and again, aware of the fact that the person actually knows the answer to this question sat over there, but the, I think that social groups naturally need to do this. Right? Uh, I think there's a tendency within, um, within sort of contemporary popular theory of this kind of ideal, this nirvana of a place where we don't have division. Right? But you can't, I, don't, I just don't think it's humanly possible to have no boundary lines. The questions I think that should concern us is how we draw those boundary lines and what the implications of being in or out of those boundary lines are. Those to me are hugely important things to think about. Like what is the nature of being an out group person to a particular in group and how you're treated? That's something we should be deeply, deeply concerned with. I think the idea that we can that we can have a society without any division, I think, personally, I think is impossible. I don't think that works uh, sociologically. I don't think humans can work that way. You have to have some sort of dividing spaces that go, this is how I know where I belong, and this is how I know where you belong, right? The difficulty and the thing that concerns me then, and let me just, I feel like I'm now going to repeat myself, so I'll say it quickly, is that what we invariably do as humans, is going back to, to what, what you were saying, is that once we've divided those lines, we then start to use pejorative language to discuss those who are not us. And to me, that's the problem. I don't see 
I don't see, even in, as, a, as a New Testament scholar, I don't see the New Testament trying to get rid of in-groups and out-groups, right? Uh, what it tries to do is change the economy of how we see. So the famous Galatians text, let me stick where I'm comfortable, you know, that within the church, Paul says that there is now no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female. It's a statement about the Christian community. What he doesn't say is that these statuses don't exist anymore. He basically says they're, they don't have economic value within the this community, uh, but they're still there. And now, it's a bit of a dream picture, I would say, but trying to think about how you could have these groups living and working together and not using their particular status as a reason to exclude themselves from one another. But notice, while he's doing that, he's still drawing a circle and saying, there's a church, and therefore there are people who are in that group, and there are people who are not in that group. Uh, so, so that would be... Uh, I'd love to know whether I'm right <laughs> about Is that he right? sociologically. Just say no and we'll move on. <laughs> uh, I, I was going to offer partially. Partially right. <laughs> yeah, because take a look at the church. I mean, the reality is that that idea was utopian as well. Yes. I mean, the, if you're telling me, which I know, that Sunday morning is the most segregated time, it's Christians discriminating against Christians. Yeah. So... Let's see, this is almost 30 years ago, goodness. Um, I was at a, a conference of 25 African-American leaders and 25 rabbis, clergy meeting, and we asked each other, how do you perceive the other? So the, the <laughs> African-Americans said, they looked at us, rabbis, and they said, we're white people, but we just happen to be Jewish white people, which we took somewhat... Uh, aback from that because we don't see ourselves as white people necessarily. I mean, Jews are of all different racial backgrounds and so forth. So they asked. Then we they asked us to, how do we look at how do we see them? And we said, you're Christians. You're just black Christians. They didn't they didn't appreciate that because that was a defining characteristic for them that they were black. So for us, the world was. Christian, I mean, it was Jewish, non-Jewish. For them, it was black or white or whatever other color. So, you know, we, we, we tend to make these groups for a variety of reasons, some of which are legitimate. So in, in the, uh, you'll call it the Old Testament, in, in, the, in, the, in the Torah, there's an event at Mount Sinai. And that event is one in which the Torah is given to the Jewish people in a covenanted relationship that's a special relationship carved out for positive reasons, and that puts, puts a whole group of people in a distinct position in history, mm. for, be for better <laughs> and for worse. So uh, there, there's times at which those are to our benefit, and those times at which they're, they're selfish and uh, d potentially destructive. I think that's an excellent point. You know, um, Joel, you mentioned the the characteristics that reinforce uh, why we gather into groups. And of course, one of those is not only our commonalities, it's actually sharing a common enemy. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in the UK actually does uh, talks in an amazing book called uh, In God's Name um, about the divisions between the three Abrahamic faiths. And he says, the problem is that groups tend to find one common enemy. It isn't just us against everybody else. It's us specifically against these people. And then it becomes almost impossible to be able to dialogue because to dialogue with them means to actually risk and jeopardize your own group identity and dynamic, which makes it very, very tough. Let's go to our next question here. Um, do we have another one ready to go? Here we go. What we got? With so many views and ideas of truth, even just biblical truth, how can you be sure that you are understanding Scripture properly? How can you be sure you are standing on truth? I'm not taking that question. You're not taking that one? Go That's, it's, yeah. it, it's very simple. My view is right and yours is wrong. <laughs> I agree. Um, and, and, <laughs> you agree. Um, again, some rabbinic wisdom. It says, Ezehu chacham, who is wise? The answer is, halomed mikol adam. The person who learns from every other person. Nobody has a lock on, from my perspective, on the absolute truth. Uh, scripture is both the most exalting text, and it's also the weapon that's been used for incredible destruction and harm. So how you read the text uh, determines, to a large extent, how you behave and act in the world. So, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of people cherry-pick parts of the uh, the text, scripture, 
uh, in all of our traditions and then use it improperly to advance their own selfish agendas. So we've, we've got to be careful about that. We're doing an interfaith Bible study at the synagogue right now with some Anglican uh, churches. And it's very fascinating because we, we look and we see the text has so many different layers that can be explored and can be peeled away for different interpretations. And you realize it's so, it's so rich in meaning that there isn't one singular literal uh, interpretation that excludes everything else. Except maybe thou shalt not murder, thou shalt <laughs> steal. There's a couple, maybe. Let me say a couple of things that connects with some of the things that, that emerged earlier. Sociologically, we know that people come to religious texts in and through their own cultural lens. Mm. If you're in a position of power or you're a marginalized person within society, you will come to the text differently. You will interpret these things differently. And so we know that gender, social class, race and ethnicity and so forth come with different perspectives. And I think to your point, then to listen carefully, to not assume that my white male middle class perspective captures everything that comes in and through scripture, uh, to not naively assume that. And I think this is why it's so important to... Uh, to dialogue and to gather with others who think differently, both within one's own faith tradition as well as across faith traditions, to have a, a broad appreciation and respect, uh, and to not naively assume that Jesus was white and blonde hair and blue eyed. Swedish. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's my favorite. <laughs> Swedish. Um, it's, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say very quickly that the answer is you can't be certain, and that's precisely <laughs> what the text should. Uh, the, the power of the text is that it informs you of ideas and, and insights at the particular time that you look at it. And that doesn't mean it's relative, but it means that truth is not absolute and there's a truth in this period of time, in this circumstances, that might not apply exactly the same way in another circumstance and you have to be uh, able to to, to, to live with that kind of mm. tension. Mm. Now, I just was reminded of um, there's some fascinating observations to make if you look at, for example, the New Testament book of Revelation and how it was read in and around about the 1960s in, in the US. And so you'll find uh, some of the civil rights group, you find like you can dig out sermons by Martin Luther King Jr. where they're reading Revelation and this text about oppression and this text about these anti-God powers and they're reading it going, well, this is a text for our time. At the very same time, you've got the sort of white Christian groups in America are reading this text going, like, what has this got to do with? And you get things like the late, late planet Earth coming out because they're reading this text go, well, we can't see who this refers to. It must be something way off in the future, you know, or some other country somewhere. And so you've got two groups of people in the same country divided by, you know, some, in one sense, some people might say major, other people say minor differences. And the way they come to the text is hugely different as a result of that. Yet confessionally, if you laid out doctrinally their statements, they would look remarkably similar on paper. And I, so I really take that point that, that our social context can really color what we start drawing out of, uh, of text. That's excellent. Do we have uh, another question? Let's see what we've got here. Does religion create more division or bring people closer together? Oh, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> Next. Anyone care to field that one? Um, it, you know, a, lot of people, a lot of people blame religion yeah. as the cause for all sorts of uh, uh, evil and troubles in the world. And um, I think that's, that's an unfair um, a castigation of religion. It's also the thing that uplifts and yeah. motivates as many people, if not more, to do good and to work for... Um, <laughs> for a, a world that's, that's devoid of all the pain and suffering. So again, it comes down to people, it comes down to um, how you apply the text and how you act on it. Hmm. So it's, um, it's, that's why it's, the answer is yes, it does both. Um, it, it certainly is both, and I think some of the naive assumptions among religious folk is that if a person is not of any kind of faith tradition, that they for, 
are not doing good things. So there's really excellent data that comes out in the United States that shows that religious people distrust atheists. And yet we know from more and more data that's coming out that atheists and those who say they have no religion are as actively involved in volunteering and charitable giving as those who are attending religious services weekly. Uh, we know there are atheist movements, if you will, if you've heard of something called the Sunday Assembly uh, that started in London, England, where they gather every Sunday in empty church buildings and they sing secular songs, and they have secular speakers, and they raise money for all kinds of good causes, and they go and they feed the homeless and they plant community gardens, etc. Uh, but these kinds of things are lost in the gap between uh, these two worlds. And uh, so, yeah. You, you don't need God to do good things. Nope, you don't. I mean, morality doesn't necessarily have to be based upon a theology. <laughs> So, absolutely. Yeah. And Joel, just to follow up on that question, uh, in your sociological work, particularly in Canada, you find that actually, uh, along with the nons, as you call them, this, this growing group who have no affiliation, you also have this other group over here that's increasingly growing of uh, new spiritualities, whether that's new age or just any kind of individualized, expressive individualism. And for some reason, people seem to be returning, particularly my generation, in droves to spiritualities, but not necessarily to religion. So sociologically, what, what is the difference between those two things? Why are people seeing these as different kind of expressions of their faith? Yeah, uh, I would say, uh, I'm just working on a project on religious nuns, and uh, those who say they have no religion in Canada and the U.S. And when he says nuns, it it's not the Catholic nuns. nuns. That's right. I always have to specify. Uh, yes, yes. As sociologists of religion talk about it. So uh, I would actually say that not as many are spiritual but not religious as we assume. I think it, it's a partial myth, but for those for whom that is true, uh, it, it is this categorical boundary making statement. What they mean is that I'm not religious, meaning I'm not dogmatic. I don't have these traditions that are holding me down. I don't have uh, religious hierarchies, etc. And by contrast, by being spiritual, one believes that they're more tolerant, more inclusive, more open to ideas, etc. I think when you start to tease those things out, that you find this is um, not exactly true. In fact, some of the most inclusive positions are very exclusive hmm. when it comes to the spiritual but not religious and all kinds of other examples as well. But I think those who say they're spiritual but not religious are trying to make this distinction. We're not part of the formal, organized forms of religion, and we're more open to all kinds of other expressions. Yeah, I, I think it has a lot to do with an aversion to being part of organized religion, which is why I always encourage people to join the synagogue, because we're not that organized. <laughs> so, um, but... Um, so, so what, what does that mean? That people don't want structure. They don't want to be told what to do. That's their perception. Um, and so they, they, people call themselves spiritual. I've had innumerable conversations with people who say that. And to this day, I'm not sure what that means. Because there's no spiritual calendar. There's no spiritual holidays. There's no spiritual theology. It's, it's do your own thing, which... You know, if it works, fine. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that, that that's not a uh, viable way to do things. I just, from my perspective, have a hard time understanding how you form a community, how you mobilize people to do the good um, with something so ambiguous as, as spiritual. And, um, yeah, that's... That's great. Let's get our next question up on screen. <laughs> It said that, uh oh, there's the word postmodernism. It said that we're living in an era of postmodernism. This is for you then, Joel. How do we dialogue when our view is so easily written off as you have your truth and I have mine? Has this view worsened or helped division? I think David wanted to start with that one. <laughs> no, I, I, I. <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought you were joking when you said you wanted me to start with. Yeah, no, please do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the yeah, old moral relativism mm. kind of argument that you're okay, I'm okay, and everything goes. Everything is fine. But uh, I, I think that um, sort of cheapens the, the dialogue. It, um, it, it, it doesn't really add um, value to religious principles or to any position. 
So from my my perspective, when you say that, um, there, you're 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 not really engaging in someone. There's there's no mm. there, there's no point here to the conversation because the ultimate um, outcome of this is just sort of an mm. a slosh of undefinable character. Yeah. Um, what what really sharpens the debate is when you not that you say that I have the truth, but here's here's how I uh, how I look at it. This is the context. This is the historical context. This is the scriptural mm. context. This is this is uh, how personally I engage on this particular issue, yeah. and I can I can give you a context for that yeah. because it's part of my story. Yes, we talk a lot about personal narratives, so this is part of my story. It's part of my history. That's rich, and that has some gravity to it that yeah. should prompt another person to listen and take it seriously and learn from. Mm. And so I think that's that's a more viable way um, than to to simply just sort of toss up your hands and say, you know, it's a tie. Yeah, I, I, I find myself thinking, and, and I, re I really agree with what you're saying there, that it almost comes across to me sometimes, and I, you, you do hear this out, uh, this sort of idea bouncing around quite regularly. I, I struggle to engage with it. I struggle to find the energy sometimes to engage, not with this question, it's a great question, but when somebody says that, because it feels to me like a form of, let me make up a term now, but you know, almost a, a sort of form of sort of philosophical colonialism. You know, that 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 sort of says, actually, let's normalize everything. You know, so we'll, in in the pursuit of looking like we're doing good work, we're just going to say everybody's welcome to be whatever they want to be like, as long as it's like this. And and ultimately, it it does start to fall apart, and and it's disrespectful method. It looks like a highly inclusive method to say, well, you can have your truth and I'll have my truth and we'll all just, we'll all just be okay with that. I actually find it, it, it looks inclusive. It's actually highly exclusive because what it's ultimately doing is saying, don't have anything that I disagree with, you know, and I'm not convinced. And I, and I think this dialogue is, is leaning quite happily that direction that, that, you know, and I take your points about how to do successful dialogue. This is not found, successful dialogue is not found in pretending we all agree and not pretend or, and it's definitely not found in pretending that we don't agree, but it doesn't matter. You know, I actually think that's so often particularly, and I see that in our political climate when it comes to issues of religion in particular, this attempt to try and normalize everything like, oh, religious people, this is how religious people think, or this is how religious people uh, are. And it's very subtle, um, but, I, but I would see it in a lot of categories of, of societal life that we're trying to just normalize people into categories. You know, I would even, if I can be so bold. I would even say you see that happening in, in our sort of same-sex marriage debates and things like that, an attempt to push people into a normally successful, sort of normally acceptable, sorry, category that we say, oh, here's a way that we're willing to, to work you in society, and it just looks like what we're always used to. It looks like huge inclusion. It's actually quite destructive exclusion, uh, and which is why I would use the term colonialism uh, to, 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 to sort of try and describe it. It might be a really bad use of the term, but it kind of is how I think of it. It's the sort of sense that we can, we, we can all disagree about everything mm -hmm. apart from the fundamental pr principle that it's okay to disagree about everything and find no levels of commonality. You know, it's very, yes. it's colonial in the sense of it's quite totalitarian. You yes. know, if you don't operate within that paradigm, you're a bigot because you're not able to express your view that actually this might not be the, the value of tolerance as you see it. Yes. Rabbi, you want to say yeah, something? I was just going to add that I think it's also condescending as well. Mm -hmm. That is to say, the person that holds the more power in the relationship yeah. can actually say that, which is dismissive of the other point of view. Mm -hmm. And so that usually irritates me when you know I engage people and they just sort of kiss it off as well. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay, and it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Let's look at our next question here. <laughs> What's the difference between proselytizing and sharing a really good idea that that is about eternal salvation and you need to believe it now? Or just we'll end it a really good idea. What's the difference? It's unsolicited medical advice. <laughs> You're telling me what's going to make me feel better, be better, and do better. I didn't ask you. Did I ask you? Did I invite you to tell me? No. But you have to share the good news. Well, maybe it's good news for you, but I don't know. From the way I look at it, it wasn't so good news for one guy in particular. He got crucified. 
So there are a lot of different perspectives on that, but proselytizing is always, again, done primarily by people in power, people who, have, who are the majority, and try to impose upon other people. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not consensual. It's not, it's not done in a, often, and people who do it may think they're doing it in that way, but it's never received, I can tell you, as a person whose door has been knocked on many, many times. Um, it's not done because I elicit it, and even if I tell them, I appreciate you, uh, you know, knocking on my door, but I'm Jewish, and they keep on going. <laughs> It's like, yeah. did you not hear what I just said? <laughs> that was a polite way of saying no, because our history of being proselytized is not a positive one. Yeah, and, and Canadians are clear in all kinds of studies that this is the one thing, among other things, that they do not like about religious groups. And uh, it, it is that private narrative. So we go back to that postmodernist discussion, for better or worse, Canadians embrace this private religious narrative. You can believe whatever you want, but do not push it on me, unsolicited, uninvited, etc. Now, having said that, so we're sitting here, and in a very subtle and very uh, subconscious way, we're all proselytizing. I mean, we really are. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here because I'm not pushing Judaism, but I'm giving you a different perspective. I'm, I'm, there's a marketplace of ideas here. So when we put it out, in the marketplace, that means it's available to purchase. So on some, some very unintentional, perhaps subconscious level, we do do that. But that's, that's okay in that context because it's not aggressive, it's not non-consensual and so forth. So are we, are we drawing then, because um, I think this is a really helpful discussion to, to draw, are we drawing then a distinction and perhaps, or rather maybe we should draw a, a clarifying distinction between sort of, uh, you talked earlier about storytelling, you know, extraying our narrative. Uh, there's a part of me wants to, I don't like the term, but talk about advertising, you know, at some level advertising, if not understood properly, could be perceived as a proselytizing of sorts, which I don't think it is. Uh, what would be the thing about proselytizing? In terms of just to try and help this question a little bit, where's the line between, hey, I want to tell you a story, right, uh, about, about my life, it, which is welcomed perhaps in the context, imagining it is. Where does that story cross the line from, here's my personal journey, which, which would hopefully be welcomed in a conversation, and where does that cross? Do you understand what, what I'm scratching at? How would you guide people to say, here's, here's how to live your own life without enforcing it in a way that becomes proselytizing? I mean, usually there's a context in which there's an invitation to hear your story. Mm. So if you just come up to me and you're a complete stranger and you're telling yeah, me your story, which is Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and, and <laughs> you know, if you're going to go to hell if you don't uh, listen to my story. I'm surprised to hear you think that. That's, uh, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, you get confused sometimes. So, it's more like, so. where am I? Where am I? So, um, yes. Yeah, so, so in, the, in, in a lot of the interfaith contexts that I, that I uh, uh, engage in and, and, and have activities, people tell their story. Mm. But it's, it's, a, it's an environment in which we want to hear people's stories. Yeah. But I don't want to hear you tell me that your story means that I'm, I'm in error. Yeah. So I, I think people, most people know where that line is. Yeah. That, and and it's, it, especially when you're being targeted. So there's a lot of campaigns out there that have targeted Jews in particular, but other people as well, for conversionary efforts. I mean, the, uh, the, the Baptists in uh, the U.S. have a special um, department in, in the, I think it's Southern Baptist, which is funded to go out and convert the Jews. Mm -hmm. So, like, really? Good luck. You know, uh, spend a lot of money because you're wasting it. You're wasting your resources on, on something that you could probably put it to better use for. Yeah, personal relationship definitely matters in that context. And so when you say the invitation, and we know from countless sociological studies across world religions around the world, that the number one reason a person joins a religious group, converts to a new religious group, is because they know someone who's part of that group, mm -hmm. for whom they have built up trust and respect and relationship, mm -hmm. et cetera. 
outside of those contexts, it's very rare that people suddenly join a new religious group, regardless of the group. Yeah, oftentimes in marriage, nowadays, interfaith marriages. Right. So that's that's another. Is marriage a form of proselytizing, would we say? Or is, should we just avoid that? Next question. <laughs> Let's go to the next question here. The answer it is yes. Me, the reason that this question is important, just that, that within a lot of... Uh, at least my experience of different Christian groups is that there can be a group pressure. You'll see my own sort of, you know, a group pressure on the individual that, you know, so, so like I'm friends with someone who's a Muslim, for example, the assumption can be from my group that if that friendship continues for, you know, over a period of three coffees and becomes a friendship, if either one of two things will happen, they must eventually surely become a Christian or I will become a Muslim. There's almost, it might not be in the, so I think there's a pressure on individuals, I, let me just speak for what I know, within churches, that if they have cross faith or from Christian to, to non-Christian, and, you know, sort of faith groups, that there's a pressure on people to, for that to be something other than, so you get, we have this horrible term, friendship evangelism that appears in certain Christian groups, which I think, well, these two terms don't work well together. It's either one or, or it's the other, but let's just name it what it is. Uh, and it strikes me that it's an important space, perhaps even as a pastor to say, actually, it's, it's important to have friendships, and those friendships might cross religious boundaries, and that's okay, you know, and that, uh, you know, and actually to respect those boundaries and look out for the attempts to proselytize you as much as look out for your own attempts to proselytize the other. I think that's, I think that's really important. Uh, I actually think that's really important friendship to develop, you know. One, one last uh, comment on the public uh, billboard type of proselytizing. So many years ago, I don't know if anybody remembers these, there used to be billboards, I don't know up here, but in the States, Jesus is the answer. Now, as a Christian, probably when you see that, I'm making an assumption here, you're going, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. Now, as a Jew driving down the street and seeing that, I'm going, so what's the question? You know, obviously, we're asking different questions. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's your <laughs> answer, but I don't know what, what, what the answer is. To what question? Well, I mean, in Sunday school, Jesus is the answer to every question, if you don't know. So I think that's what they mean. <laughs> and, it's and a safe bet. Yeah. D depending on, on where you are in the States, it's actually an advert for Jesus's tire shack, uh, which is just <laughs> <laughs> further down the road. <laughs> yeah. As in the Star Spangled Banner, Jose, can you see? Uh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to the next question here. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> How do we talk with grace but not passivity? How do we defend our faith without hostility? I suppose those are two different questions that someone's put in one text, which is very cheeky. I mean, I think all of the helpful recommendations you provided in your opening remarks capture that. Mm. I think one can still hold to their beliefs on whatever topic and do so with grace and with respect and with openness, etc. But I think th that is a learned skill and it needs to be modeled within the different communities that, we, that we're part of. But uh, I mean, this is, in a sense, the joy every day being in a university classroom. Part of my task is to cultivate an environment whereby students would exchange very different and potentially even hostile perspectives relative to one another. But to do so with an element of grace and respect, uh, I think this is a fundamental cornerstone of, of the university environment. But all of your practical things were helpful. Yeah, and, and also, I think, if we, if we examine our religious traditions, traditions that have very defined dogma and creeds and, and tend to be more absolute and literal, there's a greater tendency to defend those things with a, with a, with a vigor and sometimes that crosses into hostility. For Jews, you know, we say if there's two Jews, there's going to be three opinions. So, you know, we, 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 we pride ourselves on critical thinking. So the, the answer isn't what we're seeking. It's asking the right question. You know, somebody shared this with me. They said, when they came home from school, their mother did not ask them, what did you learn in school today? The mother asked, what good question did you ask today? And so if, if, we, if we tend not to have to... Um, be the defenders of our faith, we can engage in dialogue in a much more open and uh, uh, inviting way, I think. 
So I, I do want to add one other prime. I think there's something about intergenerational social contexts that are really helpful here. I think this doesn't automatically come with age, but I think with age and wisdom, there comes an ability to dialogue with grace and to still hold fervently to one's perspective. And I think it's really helpful, particularly for younger generations, to constantly interact with those who are older, wiser, walk down the road, who hopefully embody these kinds of things, I think are really, really invaluable. That's great. Um, let's go to our last question here. This will be our last one as we, as we close off our evening. Should we be striving to associate with other groups, and how does this process start? Joel, you spoke to uh, that as perhaps the fundamental value to move us forward is to actually seek to associate with people who aren't like us and don't think like us and don't sound like us. Uh, so do you want to speak to that? And then we'll have each of our panelists uh, answer that as we close off. Sure. I, I think sociologically and theologically, this is something that one should aspire toward. Um, I think, especially in a Canadian context, that values multiculturalism and diversity and pluralism, et cetera. And I'm not suggesting that this is the, uh, the ideal or perfect society or that these kinds of traits go without their flaws, but this is the social context we live in. And therefore, I think there's great merit to uh, seek into dialogue with those who think differently than ourselves, to do so within our, our own traditions, our faith traditions, uh, to interface with those of different generational groups, with different racial and ethnic groups, and so forth, uh, and to do so within our communities and neighborhoods. Uh, and it, you just start in small ways. You, you start by doing within some of the low-hanging fruit within your own. I think this is great, right? I think dialoguing, throw, I mean, we've talked at a fairly general abstract level, but if I just threw a topic right down the middle and said, let's have a conversation. I'm sure within this room, there'd be diverse perspectives. And that begins to open up some of those, those opportunities. Yeah, and, and I think that, I, I agree. Um, as you might well expect, the way our, our conversations are going, I think we're, we're speaking from very similar places. I, I think that, um, probably to go back to what I said right at the start, Adam, I, I think that we have to be careful about how we define groups, or rather, careful that we do define groups, that these are something which somebody has defined and we've chosen to be part of, or we've defined and dragged other people into it. Um, I, I want to hold to my kind of core theological principle of a God who doesn't show partiality, which therefore encourages me to always look very carefully at the boundary lines I'm drawing and ask, how am I drawing these particular lines and what is the impact on me? Uh, and how am I using that then to affect my impact on, on others? Uh, and, and if that becomes negative, then I really need to do some soul searching. At some, and I mean, this is just as an individual as to why am I choosing to negatively define that particular group? Going back to, to your comments, Rabbi, earlier about how, if it, can I see the person of, can I see God in this person? Um, so so for me, it strikes me as interesting as a New Testament scholar, how often when cornered, that's the wrong term, but when pushed on certain issues, uh, Jesus does this, uh, who is Jewish, and also Paul does this, who is also Jewish, that they, uh, the, the text that comes to mind for me is in Galatians 5, Paul says, well, the whole law is summed up in one sentence, you love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so to me, should we be striving to associate other groups? Should we be attempting to love our neighbor? Uh, you know, is is the answer that I want to throw out to a question like that. And, and maybe that also then is the answer as to how this process starts. Who is my neighbor and how can I love them? Uh, it seems to me to be something about how we go about doing that. The question really should be, not should we, but it should be a statement. We must. We really don't have any alternative. When I grew up in uh, Los Angeles in the way back, the um, there were only Christians and Jews. Lots of Christians, a few Jews. The world was really simple. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, our society is so diverse, so complex, that how can we navigate without knowing and interacting with other people? So th I think that's the whole premise for these interfaith activities that you see in the community here, these initiatives. Now, inherent in that is what we were talking about before is, is our own stereotypes and assumptions that we, we, we carry. 
So how do we liberate ourselves from that to properly engage in uh, healthy interfaith relationships? I think the way in which we do that is we increase our religious literacy. And that's a pet project of mine um, is to do that. <coughs> so at, at Beth Sedek, five years ago, we started a program uh, named after the woman who funded the program, Lil Fader. It's called the Lil Fader Interfaith Scholar in Residence Program. What we have done is we hire a person from another religious tradition on our staff to teach the congregation about their religion. The premise is we don't really know very much about any of the other religions. So how can you encounter somebody that you have absolutely no really healthy appreciation for who they are? And if I said to the congregation, please, everyone, this year I want you to learn about Sikhism, so please uh, go to a Gudwara, um, go to the library, go on the internet, learn all you can, and then at the end of the year, we'll, we'll come back together and see what we all know. How many people do you think in a congregation of my, my congregation, 600 families, would do that? Less than a handful. So that's, that's highly ineffective, but we brought somebody in and that gives them the stamp of, if I may use, introduce the word kosher. Uh, it made it kosher for people to study about another religion. Because we said, this is a value of the synagogue. So we started with uh, Sikhs. And um, I said in, in my high holiday sermon of the congregation when we launched the program, what do you know about Sikhs out there? You know, people nodded. I said, I'll tell you what you know about Sikhs. They work at the airport. They drive taxis, they wear turbans, and some of them carry daggers. Now, on the basis of that, how do you form a relationship with another human being? So we had a scholar come in and teach us for a whole year about Sikhism. The second year, we did Native Spirituality, which ended with a sweat lodge ceremony, which was really cool. Third year, we did something absolutely risk risky. We had an imam on the staff, probably the first time in history than an imam has been on the staff of a synagogue. He wrote bulletin articles, we had lectures, amazing. We, the two communities got to know each other. Last year was Buddhism, this year Hinduism with uh, Dr. Uh, Tina Ruparel from the University of Calgary. So we've gone through this process, deliberate intentional process of learning about other people. So religious literacy is part of what makes this uh, important. So yes, we have to, we have to, it's not should, it's not voluntary. We really must make a commitment to interfaith uh, dialogue, conversation, not just talking, but doing. That's why um, I'll get a plug in here uh, to thank the uh, Westside Kings Church for all that you've been doing with Habitat for Humanity. That's, that's faith in action. And part of the interfaith, part of, uh, part of it is when we go out and we build as an interfaith team. Now, they probably had to redo the work that we did when the clergy got out there, but um, it was a very positive experience. That's what we need to do. So I hope people will do that. The process starts tonight. Got to make a commitment to do that. I think that's an amazing place to uh, close off our evening and to close off actually this whole series, you know, talking about why it is that there's a growing divide and an inability to listen and talk to each other and to actually come together as people with differing perspectives, differing backgrounds and views, um, and to suggest that we can actually just have a conversation in and of itself, whatever else comes out of this, and, and we trust that it was incredibly valuable for you guys to hear from uh, these three different guys. But whatever else comes out of it, the value is that that conversation can take place. And I think that's a profoundly important thing for our world to see. That what if our world was able to, uh, you know, look around for where constructive dialogue is taking place and find it in churches and synagogues and mosques and, and faith communities. People who often are branded as incredibly dogmatic and insular actually showing the world how to talk. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what we're jumping into tonight. And we thank you guys so much for coming out. And, and let's uh, join in thanking our panelists as well as we close. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark.
So this closes off our evening. Uh, Joel, you mentioned that um, you know dialogue is a is a is a key part of moving forward and and being able to create space for people, and that's really exactly what we're trying to do. At 1830. If you haven't joined us before, this is a conversational space. It exists as a place in which we engage with big questions, uh, and we don't suppose or hope that we will all agree on the answer to those questions. And so I encourage you guys, if this is your first time or or a millionth time, to continue to uh, bring friends, continue to grow and build what we're doing here because uh, these kind of conversations are more important than often we realize. And so this closes off our night. Don't let the conversation end here. Stick around, grab a coffee. But if you need to take off, have a safe drive home. And uh, we hope to see you next Sunday.